1997, I got to work uh, a summer out of a camp in Colorado. I got to be a wilderness adventure guide. And uh, growing up in Wisconsin, where we had no real mountains, uh, it, was, it was kind of an exciting thing, and it was a little bit different. And part of my job that summer would be leading backpacking trips into the wilderness with junior high and high school age youth. And on most of those trips, we always included some climbing and rappelling. I had never done either of those things. So, staff training for me, uh, right off the bat, included going on a backpacking trip with our camp director to learn both the, the lay of the land and the trails that we would use and the parts of the of Pike National Forest we would be in, uh, and then learning how to set up for climbing and rappelling with the, the ropes and webbing and carabiners and tying the different knots and those types of things. And uh, there was one point in training where we spent one day and we had to, the, the several of us being trained, had to just kind of scope out the area that we were in, find different rocks and ledges and, and things of, the, of that nature that might work well for climbing or rappelling. And we had to set up our own climb or rappel station. We had to set up a belay station and safety ropes and all of those types of things. And let me tell you, it is, well, and then we would set it up, uh, we would call our, our director and uh, another wilderness staff over, to, and they would check everything for us. And then our director, Craig, uh, would harness up and we would put on our harness and he would belay, so we would keep the safety rope. And you, the person who set it up, would have to either climb or rappel on what you had set up. <laughs> and it's one thing, it's one thing to look it over and, and look at all the equipment and the knots and things and the, the tree that you picked and thought it was really sturdy and say, yeah, that looks really trustworthy. And it's another thing to actually rappel and back up over a ledge and lower yourself on this thing that you say you trust. Putting that trust into action is a little tougher. And it kind of highlights this idea that trusting can be a challenge. And I think that's central to this reading from Isaiah. So let me, let me walk you through that very quickly. From Isaiah chapter 7. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. And I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Now, that reading requires a little bit of unpacking, I realize. Ahaz is king of Judah. That's a, the southern kingdom. So if you follow that Old Testament history of God's people, you have this, um, this land and this country and this people of Israel who are one. And we know some of the stories of King David in that time, and kind of a high point in Israel's history, where, where all those people and all the tribes, the 12 tribes of of Israel are all together as one people. But very shortly after David's reign, uh, in fact, just two generations later, his grands, under his grandson, there's a split. We have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, in, in most of the history, uh, retains the name Israel. And so sometimes we have to uh, kind of discern in the Old Testament, okay, are we talking about just the northern tribes, or are we talking about, like, everybody now? But there's a northern kingdom, and there's a southern kingdom, which is called Judah which is actually Judah and Simeon, I believe. But, um, but you have this split. Ahaz is king of that southern kingdom of Judah. And trust is difficult for Ahaz. Much like that repellent metaphor I gave you. Trusting can be a challenge. And we see that in Ahaz, and we see that in what's happening in what, uh, what I, Isaiah is bringing to Ahaz, because Ahaz is under threat. His country is under threat. They're, they're not the biggest kids on the block by any means. And there's a threat from the east. It's Assyria. 
They're, they're kind of the big bad guys, but they're, they're pretty far away. But they've got their eyes set on moving westward, expanding their kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel has banded with another group to the, I guess it would be the northeast, Syria. So we have Assyria and Syria. Israel and Syria have banded together because they're going to they're gonna work together to fight off Assyria. And they're kind of like a kind of like a corporation in a really competitive marketplace. Might just sort of gobble up other smaller companies in order to become a little bigger, in order to survive in that space. Well, that's what Israel and Syria plan to do. They're going to gobble up Judah. They're going to they're going to take over Judah. They're not looking for an alliance. They're looking to to kind of acquire this smaller country so that they can also acquire their resources and their soldiers, of course, um, and kind of bolster themselves for this Assyrian threat. And Ahaz is caught in the middle of all this. And for Ahaz, trusting is definitely a challenge. Leading up to the verses that I just read, Isaiah is calling on Ahaz to trust in his God. To trust his God for, for protection and for provision and for direction in this very difficult time. Because Ahaz was, was the king of a people with whom God had formed a covenant. He made an agreement. He made some promises to these people. God chose them. And he chose to make an alliance with them. Ahaz was a direct descendant of King David. David had received those promises of God that as long as there's someone on your throne and they are faithful to me, I'm going to be with them. I'm going to take care of them. And this is what, this is what Isaiah is calling Ahaz back to. Ahaz already has this alliance, if you will, with God. But Ahaz instead is trying to make other alliances. See, Ahaz is... Inclination is to trust the political maneuvering that he can create, that he can manufacture. And ultimately, his plan is to trust Assyria. He doesn't trust Judah and Assyria coming after him and wanting everything that he has. He thinks he can make an alliance with the bigger kid on the block, who's a little bit further away at this point. That's the plan that Ahaz is favoring as Isaiah comes to him, encouraging him to trust his God. And why? Why is, why is Ahaz thinking this way? Well, because trusting can be a challenge. Now my guess is that you feel absolutely no threat from Assyria, or Syria, or Israel for that matter, where you're sitting today. It's especially not those countries as they existed some 2,700 years ago. Um, but I think the idea of alliances and this wrestling match that Ahaz had in terms of who will I trust and how, what does it mean to trust, I think that may resonate with us and that may mean something to us today. See, because God has made an alliance with you. I mean, he's called you into his family. He's called you his own. We, we saw that with April and, and this whole baptism thing. That is God making a covenant. That is God making a promise to April and making that promise to each of you as his baptized child those who've been called into his family. He said, you're mine, and I'm your father, and I'm on your side, and I'm going to take care of you. And you have these promises. He's promised to be with you. He's, he's, he's promised to come back and to right all the wrongs and remove every threat. But it's tempting. It's tempting to look other places for protection, for answers. And kind of, kind of like that repelling scenario, it's one thing to look around and say, yeah, it looks pretty trustworthy. <laughs> it's another thing to actually trust, and to, take, to take action that shows and demonstrates trust. Because trusting can be a challenge. I mean, after all, it's hard to trust God with my money, right? And my home, and my car, and the things that I have. God's Word points us to this idea of giving a tithe. See, it's hard. She agrees. We need more than a couple more amens here and there. <laughs> it's hard to trust God with, with the things that I have. But God calls us to this, right? He calls us to this idea of a tithe, of giving back 10%, recognizing that everything I have is a gift from Him. And, and I, can, I can trust Him with these gifts. We, I, but I'm called to walk in it. I'm called to, to actually do this trusting thing. So he calls us to get back as this, this starting point of tithing. It's easy to talk about, but it's, it's much harder to do. And I know. <laughs> I know because I've, I've wrestled with that myself. 
And then once we're doing it, it's hard to come to grips with the fact that that doing the minimum might actually not be trusting. Because maybe that's too easy. And for some, that actually is too easy. To actually walk in trust might look different. It's hard to trust God with my time. I mean, I've got a really full schedule. I've got a lot of things to do. There are a lot of Christmas parties, and there's work stuff, and then there's you know coming to church on Sunday, and, and there's just a lot of stuff that, that beckons for my calendar. But this idea of Sabbath that God calls us to and that he, that he really gives to us, it has to do with trust. Because Sabbath rhythms, like those rhythms of, of resting and not working hard and not doing everything, but instead allowing God to speak and allowing him to give and allowing myself to receive from him, it means taking my hands off of everything. It, it, means, it means kind of giving up some control and sitting in that space where I recognize that my God is in control. And that sometimes is really hard to do. Daily devotions, prayer exercises, worship, quiet time, all of these are balanced with service and volunteering and caring for others. They're all the things that we do. But it's hard. It's hard to trust with money, with time, and it's hard to trust my God with my relationships as well, with the people in my life, the people that I spend time with and the people I care about. But in reality, trusting has to do with, in a sense, elevating those people, not just being around them. Because a lot of times, trusting God with relationships means listening. Listening to the people that God places in my life. And that's a lot harder to do than directing the people God places in my life. I can give a lot of advice and I can give a lot of direction, but it's really hard to sit and listen and to discern what's on someone else's heart. I'd much rather give you advice and walk away than walk with you through really difficult situations. That's just the reality of who I am, and my guess is that's the reality of who you are. Because it takes discipline to not be a selfish person, to give in that regard. It's, it's hard as well to be friends with, with neighbors and family members and co-workers who, quite frankly, annoy me, who get on my nerves, who see the world different than I do, or, or sometimes might even go so far as to demean me, make fun of me, look down on me. And yet, I'm called to love those people because those are people that God placed in my life that I actually have contact with. But it's a matter of trusting my God that he has plans here and that he's at work here. And trusting can be a challenge. But if we look at this story, we find a little bit of direction. See, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. This is definitely not the only place in Scripture where we see that asking God, for a sign, asking him to be reminded that he's at work and that he is actually on our side. Like, like this happens. This happens among God's people. We just finished a series recently on Gideon, and Gideon asks for signs over and over again. He keeps asking for that. <coughs> if you look at the story of, of King Hezekiah in the Old Testament, uh, the prophet Isaiah that we're reading today goes to Hezekiah and he says, ask your God for a sign. You want the shadow to move seven steps forward or seven steps backwards? And he says, well, I guess it's kind of, I guess it would be easy, or if I wait long enough, it's going to move forward. So maybe move backwards. And God gives him this sign, the shadow reversing course. And Moses, in his, his conversation with God when he's called to go to Pharaoh, he asks for signs, and God gives him these signs to show to Pharaoh. He's throwing his staff on the ground, and it becomes a snake. Putting his hand in his cloak and taking out its leprous. And then healing it once again. So this isn't, this isn't unheard of, this idea of a sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. See, Ahaz, he's too good to be tempted like that. I mean, at least that's what he wants Isaiah to believe. He wants to look really good because in Deuteronomy, God's people were told not to put the Lord your God to the test. But, but there are really two types of testing. I think we need to discern between them. There are two places from which we can ask our God for signs, and we can ask Him for confirmation. And the first is this, this place where we say, well, I've made up my mind, now prove me wrong, God. I know what's true, but you want me to do something else, so 
Okay, show me a sign. This is Ahaz. This is the person who, who challenges God. This is the person who, who really doesn't believe. And then the second place from which we can ask for that is this stance that says, okay, I believe, but it's really hard to believe. I trust, but it's really hard to trust. And this is the sign that Isaiah is offering. It's the prayer of the, the father in Mark 6 who says, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. See, a sign for that, that second person, it's confirming, it's strengthening, and it's encouraging. A sign for that first person is threatening. Because it says that the ground they're standing on is not so solid as they might think. I came across this quote as I was reading up on, on Isaiah. Evidence cannot create faith. It can only confirm it. Where there is not faith, evidence is merely unwelcome. That's what we see in Ahaz. That's what we see in, in his response to Isaiah. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, Isaiah talking to King Ahaz, descendant of David. Is it, too little that, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And there's that, that Advent ring, that Christmas word, right? This, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And I want you to hear in these words two different prophecies. Because very often this is how God's word works. Prophecy looks, a, looks ahead a lot of times and re reminds us what we can expect from our God. And Isaiah's word is no different. But the, the, first, the first looking ahead I want you to see is really in King Ahaz's time. And in his lifetime. And what's happening in the then and there, if you will. And I want to remind us that the word, for, the word for virgin doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't have to mean that a woman would stay a virgin. Okay? The word can just as readily be translated something like young maiden. So a, a, a young lady who's uh, sort of of age but, but has not married yet and thus is still a virgin in, in the culture. So this idea of the virgin shall conceive didn't have to mean something miraculous. And while we don't know which lady in Israel was going to have a child in Isaiah and Ahaz's time, it's something that they could understand. A child's going to be born. A new, a new family will be formed. And this child is a sign for you, Ahaz. This, this child is a sign that God is with you. And here's how this child is a sign of God's presence and his work. And here's what's going to come. He says, he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. See, by the time this child grows up, the threats you face now are going to be gone. But the land you live in and the land this child grows up in will also be desolate and it will be ravaged and it will not be what you see right now. The child will eat curds and honey. Those are, those are the foods of a, of a wandering shepherd, of a vagabond, of a nomad, not of a city dweller who, in a, in a people where, uh, where crops are cultivated and, and agriculture might, might flourish from the land. Because the land's going to be destroyed. The land's going to be overrun. <coughs> this is the sign. There's a child who will grow up, and this child is a sign for you that God is present. But as this child grows up, as this child grows up, your land will be destroyed. The Lord will bring upon you, and upon your people, and upon your father's house, such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Ephraim departing from Judah is that split of the northern and southern kingdom. And as bad as God's people starting to fight against one another was, this is going to be just as bad. And I'm going to give you what you ask for. I'm going to give you the king of Assyria. That's where you want to look for help. That's where I'm going to send him. But he's not going to be much help. And he won't be. This is the result of it, Ahaz's refusal to trust God. It's the result of his lack of faith. He won't ask for a sign because he's already made up his mind. He's set his course and he's formed his alliances and he's moving in that direction. He doesn't want a sign. And trusting can be a challenge. And trusting God was too much challenge for Ahaz. 
But I mentioned there's a, a second prophecy, right? There's a, a second looking forward, just as, as Isaiah's words look forward to what's going to happen with Ahaz, they look forward further yet. And, and we know this. We know that, they, that we can understand these to look further, further ahead because it shows up in Matthew's gospel. There's a meaning here in this prophecy for you and for me. And what it means depends on your posture. Depends on where you're standing. Because remember that, that, that first posture toward for prophecy and toward God's work that says, well, I've made up my mind. Now prove to me that I'm wrong. But there's that second. There's that second that says, I believe. I believe, but it's hard. I want to trust, but trusting is hard, God. So help me do that. See, to those who have made up their minds and desire no sign, they'll find nothing good at the sign of Emmanuel. The sign will be there, but they won't. They won't like what comes with it. But I think, I think you might be in that second group. Because you're here this morning. Because you desire to gather as God's people. Because you desire to hear His word. I think, I think maybe there is that second posture in your life. Saying, God, I think I believe. I want to believe. I want to trust. But it's hard. And you recognize in your own life that trusting can be a challenge. And for you, Emmanuel truly is God with us. Emmanuel, the child, weak and insignificant, yet this is God's presence. See, Emmanuel is God's presence in a, in a land that's been ravaged, in a land that, that isn't always peaceful. Emmanuel is, is here in the broken places. In the places that don't look like, like they're flourishing. And the sign promised to you is a child. Is a child born <coughs> weak, insignificant, God's presence. A child who doesn't truly have a home, who's not quite settled, not rooted to a particular place as if they are not home yet. Emmanuel. Not just a child born at Isaiah's time, but another child written about by Matthew. Weak, insignificant, not rooted, born of a virgin. But this time, not, not the time who becomes virgin in the process of becoming not a virgin. One who miraculously retains that. This is Jesus. This is Emmanuel, and this is your sign. A sign to confirm faith, a sign to, to strengthen faith, a sign to trust. Because trusting is indeed challenging. But Emmanuel is a sign for you. Emmanuel means you can trust your God. See, Emmanuel is God's yes. Emmanuel with you in a ravaged land. Your God with you in difficulties, in trials, in challenges, in tough decisions. God is with you and he knows what you're dealing with. Temptations to make alliances elsewhere. He knows what you're dealing with, bodies that get weak, that get sick. He knows what you're dealing with, death, which steals away those that we love and we care about. God is here. God is with you. Emmanuel is his name. In Jesus, God entered our world. He entered into human life, and he entered, he entered into death. He appeared weak and insignificant. He had no roots in this place, and he was not settled here. But he had no roots in death either. So can you trust your God? Resurrection is his sign. See, the sign of Emmanuel is the sign of Easter. God was present with Israel, even when Ahaz could not trust God. God was present in Jesus, the child born of a virgin. God was present on the cross as he died for you and I. God was present on Easter Sunday as he rose to new life and as he invited you and I into that new life. And God's promise is to be present by his spirit here and now. In this place, God's promise is to return and to bring you home with Him. A promise that looks beyond the difficulties that we face right now. Emmanuel means that God is present. Emmanuel means that this is the God you can trust. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. <laughs>